Um, I'm going to be welcoming someone who I would call a hacker. I think he uh, has many different uh, labels for himself. But he's sort of been going back and forth between uh, work in Silicon Valley and then sort of grassroots activism. And he actually um, went to Silicon Valley at 16, started working there and founded his first companies and has done lots of interesting work on building tools for grassroots organizing for many, many years already. And he was one of the first, uh, he was the first employee of Twitter. And I actually had the pleasure of meeting him for the first time in New Zealand last year at a conference called Open Source, Open Society, which was organized by the Inspiral Network. There's many people from Inspiral that you can actually meet here at the fest as well. And so um, there he was talking about uh, why open source is, is important for the development of society. But today, he actually he got in touch with us again to talk about a new project that he's working on, which is tools for grassroots organizing. And so um, I'm very excited to welcome him on stage to tell us more about what he's up to and also how that has to do with platform cooperativism. So please give a very warm welcome to Evan henshaw Platt. Hi. Hey, Evan. Hi. How are you feeling at WeShareFest so far? I'm great. This is fantastic. I've been meaning to come for many years. Yeah, it's awesome that you could finally make it. So maybe to jump in and give people some context, um, I think it would be great if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what your newest project is that you're excited about and putting your energy into. Sure. So uh, AffinityWorks is a platform for grassroots community organizers. I had been working in the online advocacy space with a number of people, and we saw that the tools led up to uh, mobilizing and connecting to people, but um, they didn't support the activities of day-to-day -day community organizers, sort of participatory civil society. And so uh, we looked at what people who organized sort of member-based grassroots civil society, what they needed, and they needed a different set of tools and technologies that exist in the broader world. And we saw some of these tools exist for election campaigns, where they would set up these vast networks of volunteers, and they would have them do political organizing, and then they would shut them down at the end of the election campaign. And so what, what we said was, how do we take the tools of online advocacy, and how do we take the face-to-face the -face community organizing that happens during an election, and we provide those to civil society organizations that need them long-term? So how do we make it so that you can figure out who attends your meeting? How do you communicate with them in the mediums that they're used? How do you build a CRM, sort of a customer resource management system, but for public participation? And so, um as a person who's been involved in very many interesting companies, who also has pretty big networks, I think it's often really hard to decide where is my energy best invested. And I think it's a very common question. People who want to change the world, it's like, what is the best place to focus? And so looking at the things you've done in the past and also what's currently been happening uh, on a societal, political uh, level, why do you feel like this is the moment to, to do Affinity Works? And, and what's your sort of theory of change behind that? So the, the theory of change is that in in the things we're building, in the way we're constructing software, and the way we're constructing a society, is that the software needs to reflect the values of the society that we're trying to push forward. So we need to say, we think that society is intersectional. We think that there are lots of people coming from different perspectives that need to collaborate, and the single hierarchical organizations for social change don't work. So we need technology that lets people collaborate and work in a way that reflects that. Now, the social media world that we have today for community organizing, that does that, but it's ephemeral. Like, we go and we build a social movement around a hashtag, and it comes and it goes, and it can be really powerful, but it doesn't have that sort of day-to-day -day organizing that sustains social movements. And so we wanted to say, how do we build that in addition to that? How do we faint, you know, say you can do those day-to-day those -day activities? And then how do we structure the organizations so that small individual organizations can collaborate with networks of groups. So if you are a community organizer in a particular town and you want to work on a campaign, right now you have to go to meetings and you have to get to know people who work on that campaign in other places. There's no sort of 
uh, collaborative, uh, non-money marketplace to say, yes, we're going to do that same day of action. You know, th and, and we can take the activity that's been going on offline and bring that networking online. Yeah, and so one of the things you said uh, when we were talking the other day was how building alliances and collaborating is becoming much more important Absolutely. than it used to be. It's becoming essential. Why do you believe that? Well, we look at, we look at over the last 20 years of activism, going back to the, the organizing against the multilateral treaty agreement on investment that led up to the WTO Doha round, and you, you look at the organizing, and it's not a single organization and it's not a single set of networks. You have this sort of the, the chaos of the anti-globalization movement, all these different groups working on all these different issues. And what we need is a way for that to be sustained. We need to say, okay, yes, we're never going to have a common plan, we're never going to get ideological agreement, but we all know we're going in the same direction, so let's figure out a way in which we can tactically collaborate. And I know that you had mentioned also that you had some experiences with a consensus-based organization uh, and many of these different yeah, activist groups. How do you feel like that experience is influencing what you're doing today and how you think also that in general activism can have a big impact on social change? So I was very involved in the, the creation and the, the growth of the Indie Media Network. And in that, we attempted to build a global network of 140 organizations in two dozen languages that used consensus. And some of that worked very well in terms of we pushed power out to the edges and we were really good at collaborating, but some of that didn't work well, as in a global network operating in 20 languages with activists from all different backgrounds can't decide very well how to build software. And so I came to the conclusion that we need to have separate organizations that are dedicated to the building of the technology that have a, a concrete relationship to the social movements of the organizations they support. And that relationship can't be that they are um, of, the, of the movements, they have to be uh, collaborating with the movements. And so with the creation of Affinity, we, we structured it as a business that is a cooperative that is, can be then owned both by the workers of it and the organizations that use it. So it's, it's an attempt to build out a viable platform co-op. Yeah, so that's definitely the, the good keyword. Yeah. Um, because as you could see in the title, we also want to talk about platform co-ops. Um, a little bit of background, which is maybe interesting, is that uh, part of the platform cooperative movement actually started at WeShareFest because two of the founders, Trevor Schultz and Nathan Schneider, they actually met here in 2013. And so um, basically we've seen many different examples of attempts at platform co-ops in the past years many of them struggling quite a lot, and at least I don't really know many good examples of something really working well. So I think there's a lot of new terrain, and um, I'm really curious to understand better about how you're trying to implement that concept. So to, to give you a sense, the, the idea of platform co-ops is uh, applying the model of large agricultural co-ops. You had farmers who produced goods, and someone else controlled their access to market. In this way, you know, collecting and distributing their, their farm products. In the digital world, we have these Ubers and Airbnbs and marketplace companies of the sharing economy, which extract a huge portion of the profit and control the marketplace. And so, um, if you believe in, in, in the people who do the work controlling their work, you think we need to convert that so that it is, it is a cooperatively owned marketplace. The problem is that creating marketplaces is really difficult and there's a number of structural problems that make creating platform cooperatives hard. One, the workers, say, who do home health care, they don't think of the, the problems and spaces that you need to think of when you're creating a health care marketplace for those home health care workers. Um, and the, the people who are drivers of cars don't think of the, the, the problems of designing good uh, ride-hailing software. The other problem is that uh, cooperative funding is very conservative. Um, the cooperative funding space looks at existing businesses, existing models, and funds the cooperative versions of stable existing businesses. And when you go to market-based creation, it's incredibly unstable and incredibly risky. And so Silicon Valley is willing to dump billions of dollars into various experiments because the upside of owning these marketplaces is incredibly high. Um, 
So there was this interesting uh, evolution that you explained to me about that you started as a real co-op and now you've made a change recently. Um, could you maybe tell us about what? Yeah, you so we originally did? incorporated Affinity Works as a Colorado cooperative in the U.S. And then we went to try and raise money for it. And we went to social impact investors and we went to uh, cooperative funds that do cooperative investing. And we went to venture capitalists and we went to uh, wealthy individuals in Silicon Valley, angel investors. And what we discovered was that no one in the social impact space even though they were very concerned about political tools for organizing and the, the problems would touch us because we didn't have revenue. We didn't know what the product would be. We were building something new. And no one in the cooperative space could even sit down with us with a meeting because we were too far away from their understanding of what they could fund and their background. And then we went to the venture capital community, the other extreme of it, and they said they couldn't fund it because you were too cooperative. And we went to the foundations and the foundations said, well, we can't fund it because it's a for-profit entity that wants to sustain itself. <laughs> and so we got stuck with only getting funding from wealthy individuals in Silicon Valley who were freaked out about the political implications of Trump. So essentially, it's, it's sort of this intermediary. And what we realized was those individuals aren't enough to get you the networks and support you need to get to get the design and scaling and usability and work that you need to scale. And so we had to reincorporate from an actual cooperative to a public benefit co um, corporation with cooperative principles. And so what exactly in its implementation is really the difference then of this uh, B Corp um, with the, the cooperative bylaws? and the cooperative? Like when, when shit really hits the fan, what, what will be different and so what happens? So in the, in the day-to-day -day operations, it's the same. We have workers who have one vote for, per worker. Uh, we have um, additional organizations that are members and get to vote on things. But if, if Affinity Works runs out of money or has a crisis or is worth a lot of money, then that fight will go back to a set of corporate laws. And so like when, when there's an actual direct conflict, then we're stuck with our bylaws that are cooperative, but any board vote can change those bylaws. And so you, you lose the, the constraints of, a, of a, an actual cooperative. And so day to day, it's great, but it's less secure. And so would you say uh, that in general, the platform cooperative model needs to yeah, find alternative legal entities to co-ops to really be able to scale and grow? Or what's sort of your conclusion on funding platform co-ops? So I think that the platform co-op model needs a couple things. One, I think it needs uh, a, a large amount of money, um, and that money needs to be coming from people who are willing to take lots of risks and realize that it's a market creation problem, and market creation is both difficult and expensive, and that no one knows which group is going to be successful. So you have to make lots of small bets and then be able to follow on to the ones that start to gain traction. And so... Um, the discussion of sort of incubators or sort of, sort of seed funding of many different co-ops would be useful as long as there's follow-up funding that can actually happen. And realize that, you know, Uber isn't worth $8 billion. $8 billion has been directly invested in Uber. Um, and so a lot of these co-ops are hard to scale. You know, when you look back at Twitter, there was a time in which Twitter was free. Like, Twitter existed... And it had been launched and people started to use it, but it didn't have any value. If someone walked up and said, ah, I think Twitter's neat, can I buy it for $10? You could have bought it because at the time it had like negative $2 million in its balance books. And it was like, it's just a liability. Now you have the buy Twitter campaign trying to come up with like $15 billion to, to cooperatize Twitter and it's too late. And so when we talk about new things, we need to sort of find a way to, to build that and push it forward. Yeah, there was also an interesting experience you'd mentioned around an experiment with MIT to work on uh, developing different platform co-ops that you said failed. Yes. So uh, I co-taught a, a studio workshop at the Center for Civic Media at the MIT Media Lab where we brought in worker cooperatives and we paired them with MIT students 
and, and did the lean startup process with those students. And, and to we transform them, right, into platform Yeah, so the idea was yeah. to transform existing functional working co -op, worker co-ops into platform cooperatives and to solve the needs. And what we discovered was that those workers weren't the right people to think about it. Like the people who chose to do, form a home, like a home cleaning cooperative weren't thinking about and engaged in the, in the ways that they needed to be to form a network of home cleaning cooperatives. And certainly weren't able to think about the, the intricacies of designing the software to do it. And so that was, that was a, a really sad conclusion because part of the idea of the cooperative movement is that the individual workers should move into positions of being able to run the cooperative and the network. And the truth of the matter is that it was different skills and different ideas and different ways of looking at the world. And some of them potentially could make the transition. But of the 60 or so cooperative workers in five cooperatives we worked with, none of them were able to make that mental leap. And so what is your conclusion from that? Well, my conclusion from that is that um, what we probably need to do is pull people more from the social enterprise space, that there's enough people in the social enterprise space who are thinking about things in the right way, and that we need to structure it in a way that, that teaches design thinking and teaches lean startup techniques um, to that space in an attempt to build cooperatives, and we need a, a funding path to do it. Yeah, so maybe just as a reminder, we're going to do a few questions from the audience if the tech can give us microphones. I think that's possible. I'm just checking. Um, but so we'll do a few more questions and then we'll open it up. We'll open it up uh, later. Um, but so there's one more topic I really wanted to discuss um, because you were mentioning values and wanting to create companies that are aligned with, with the values and really like walking the talk into each detail, how it's structured and how is ownership distributed. And so blockchain has come up a lot recently around those reflections. And I think in the good and the bad can, can lead to uh, certain values being imposed on, on your organization. And uh, especially also a few years ago, blockchain was really uh, very, like, people were super excited about it at WeShareFest. And I guess it definitely is part of the technologies that's being overhyped right now. So um, I'd be really keen to hear your take on uh, this question of, is blockchain in any form useful to, to do this type of work and create these platform co-ops? Or what role would that maybe have in there? Sure. So there's a, a, a law in computer science called Conway's Law, which, uh, to paraphrase it, is the technology we will create will re reflect the institutions that create it. And so when we look at blockchain, you have to say the technology that's created is reflecting the institutions of super right-wing libertarian capitalists who are creating it. And so we can maybe reappropriate this technology, but there's a lot of embedded values in that view of the world. And then we have to say, if we take human interaction and we take human rules out of it and we decide that votes should be given based on computational power, so then, the, then you, you create a thing where we're, we're structuring political and social and human institutions around the idea that whoever is a better hacker should have more power. And I, as a hacker, when I look at what values that come out of the hacker community, some of it which I'm incredibly proud of, but some of which are incredibly problematic. I mean, you look at 4chan, and 4chan created memes, which are amazing, and they created Anonymous, which is a fantastic network of collectives that do amazing progressive work, but it also created the alt-right that got Trump elected and goes around killing people in the United States because they don't like the color of their skin or their religion. And so that same culture is like deeply xenophobic and can be deeply misogynist. And so like if that's the culture where you say, okay, people who have the best access to manipulate machines should have all the power um, and we shouldn't have human institutions where we actually get together and decide these things, I think is problematic. And so I think distributed technologies and distributed ledgers like blockchain can be perfectly interesting for a lot of things, but there's also some things where you have to say, what values are going into this and what, what kind of human interaction does it push us to do? It's also easy to think that whatever new technology will change the world. Timothy Leary thought that LSD would be used 
for elementary school and secondary school education. He thought that the best way of the future of education is everyone would just drop acid every day and they would learn how to form a new society and how to get things done. Now, obviously, people use lots of hallucinogenic drugs and it has a role in society, but we don't use it in the classroom setting to learn. And so it's easy to say, the new technology is awesome, it'll do everything, and that, that happens. And then we have to roll it back and say, well, what is the practical effects of this? Yeah, so you sort of see it with a bit of skepticism and uh, not necessarily applicable to what you're doing right now in any case and how you structure your platform co-op. Sure, so a lot of people said, well, you're building a platform co-op and you're trying to provide security and provide organizing. And I'm like, my primary goal is to meet the needs of community organizers who are trying to make social change and trying to build networks and collaborate. And their needs aren't a, a virtual governance structure based on computation. Their needs are how to get a hold of people in my neighborhood and how to remind them to show up to the meeting and how to figure out what needs they have and how to communicate with them and how to follow up with them and then how to collaborate with other people. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, could we get some mics for questions? And then, I'm not sure if they're here. Can someone pass around a mic? I think, uh, so who has questions? I think there was one here, yeah. Okay, so we have a few questions. Sorry for the not additional uh, advance warning. Okay, well, wait a moment. You could also yell if you want. No? <laughs> I think one thing that's easy to, to, it's easy to get enamored with the newest technology and the newest way of doing things. When, um, <clears throat> when, when you think about what we're building with social software is essentially what we build is new ways of doing the same human interactions on new platforms. And so, when, like, when we went back to the creation of Twitter, uh, in creating Twitter, we said, the human interactions are gonna be the same as the past. How have people interacted on past platforms using text messages, using Unix command line, using different ways of communicating, and what would it be in a mobile world? And then we started building experiments. And so, uh, when you look at blockchain, for example, the technology, the human interaction stuff is, are not going to change. Like, people have been, have been the way people are for a couple hundred thousand years. What we have is new mediums which we can shape this and potentially create new and better ways of doing, or worse ways, of doing the same human activities. Thanks. Um, yeah, back here. Hello. Oops. This is very loud. Thanks a lot for your insights. Actually, I wanted to build on the, the blockchain question uh, because I just heard about an idea of a couple of days ago regarding the Buy Twitter campaign that you mentioned that didn't succeed. And somebody raised the idea that actually with all the, um, the craze about ICOs these days and like blockchain application that raise uh, hundreds of millions issuing tokens, actually one idea could be to uh, create funds that would be able to gather enough tokens to then do some kind of a cooperative hostile takeover of a company. And do you think this kind of scenario would actually have worked for Twitter, like to be able to raise an ICO fund and then uh, made a much higher proposal than the one that was made? So uh, the, the first thing is, I think that the Buy Twitter campaign actually did succeed because even though they didn't succeed in buying Twitter, they, they pushed the idea of who owns the platform and how it's owned and trying to get companies to consider ownership structure and participation. So I, I think that they did that. I, I also think that, um, yes, with the ICOs, which is the um, initial coin offerings, the way of like doing, you mine a bunch of Bitcoins in private, and then you pump up the idea that this is going to be really valuable, and then you get a bunch of people to buy into it, um, it's actually a, a good way of tricking financial markets into putting money into things. Essentially a scam or a Ponzi scheme. Um, but uh, you can raise a lot of money that way. Um, and so, because it's a believable Ponzi scheme. 
And so I think um, I'm all for using financial trickery to try and increase the, you know, person-controlled capital. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I, there's a lot of true believers in the ICOs. Um, but the problem with doing that to buy something like Twitter is that Twitter is actually incredibly valuable. Like, it's not, a, a, it's not like trying to create cooperatives in Argentina where they created 30,000 cooperatives out of failed businesses. Like, Twitter is a business that makes billions of dollars, so you need tens of billions of dollars, and that's beyond the scale of what you can raise on an ICO. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Um, Felix from Famondo. Yeah. I have two questions, if I may. The first one concerning the special model that you used, which is not a re like a legal cooperative, but uh, close to it. Yes. Um, for me, the core issue about the platform cooperatives is creating uncorruptible businesses that can't be sold, can't be bought, can't be transformed into something else. Does your model ensure that? And the second question I have is about um, the key issue of funding, which you pointed out. Um, and then you at some point mentioned that um, there will be... Um, It will be a risky investment for every, anyone who, who's going into these kind of crazy platforms. And yeah. um, I absolutely agree with that. But um, you said then, yeah, you have to kind of <clears throat> diversify your investment and go for many different uh, platform approaches. Where I have the question, my feeling is really, we actually, and, and that really concerns all of us here also, should focus on one or two or three big projects that we really push through and don't diversify and don't think, okay, let's try 100 approaches, which are all not going to work. Um, rather, take one thing and push it big enough that it really gets the traction it needs to, to survive. So uh, the first question about um, how to make it uncorruptible and make it so that you can't convert it back, if you have democratic control of the institution, then there's no way to prevent the members of that institution from voting away their democracy. Like, if it's true democracy, and if, if, if it's one worker, one vote, and everything else, if they decide that they want to sell themselves off to a for-profit company and give away their democracy, there's nothing you can... You, like, it isn't actually democracy if you can't vote your way out of it. And so if you look at the, like, the cooperatives that existed in Yugoslavia before the collapse of Yugoslavia, a bunch of them were real cooperatives that voted to cease being cooperatives. And so I think that that's the way it falls apart. Like, you create a corporation that has bylaws that say they're cooperative, but then you can have the shareholder, worker, owners, and partners vote their way out of it. And they, the way, when that happens is because they choose to survive in a marketplace, a larger marketplace, that they need the money and resources to do. So like Twitter shut down its open API and everything else because there was a marketplace attack attempting to take over the Twitter users. And so they stopped being as open and collaborative because they exist within the larger marketplace. And as long as we have a market economic system, you're going to have platform co-ops and other cooperatives face the temptation of, and the risk of being shut down versus the other. You know, like, like is, you, you, the larger system matters a lot. Um, and what was the, the other part of that question? It was about funding. So we have about two minutes left. So funding, I think it's a terrible idea, and it's a, a common European idea that you should pick heroes and put a ton of money in them. Um, but that's not what creates uh, billion dollar companies. Like, The, the, if you want to say, how do you do technology innovation, the truth of the matter is no one creating this stuff has any idea if it's successful. The founders of every major famous technology company tried to sell their companies for pennies because they themselves didn't believe it was worth very much. And so you, there's no way to know what the successful ones are. So what you have to do is you have to play the numbers and support a lot of projects, and then eventually once one comes successful, then you follow up and support. So I think we can take one more last question. I think actually this one over here was yeah. a bit longer. She's been waiting a while. Sorry. 
and find a woman. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, um, I, at the minute, I, I work at, at Nesta, and we're looking at sort of supporting the growth of different kinds of um, sort of collaborative uh, models that are trying to create social impact. Um, I'm really interested in growing cooperatives and how you do this. A lot of what people are trying to do and what they really struggle with is connecting the uh, offline stuff, so the, the place-based, the city-based stuff, if you like, with the online models. And I wondered if you had anything to say or reflect on about how to do that well. Is there a Dunbar number? You know, Is there a limit to the growth of the network? Um, and then are we talking about modular builds? and modular connections and thinking like that? Or are we talking about scaling and growing one platform, if you follow my drift? So um, that's fascinating. When you look at the way in which platform co-ops have been built up and how they've grown, they almost always started in small, limited communities. Like, you, you couldn't go in and book on Airbnb in any city or at any time. When Airbnb launched, you could only book in Austin, Texas, during South by Southwest, in Denver, Colorado, during the Democratic National Convention when they nominated Barack Obama. Like, there was like, we're only launching for two weeks in this city for this reason because we know that there's a particular case in the market where things don't work normally. Like, there aren't enough hotel rooms. So what you need is you need to say, okay, we're going to build a broader platform of stuff. We're going to build a broader platform in which this is. But let's find a narrow case of something that works. They, then you could grow up. And too often people are like, we want to compete with Uber and we want to compete with Airbnb. So we should launch everywhere and we should do this awesome, amazing thing. And it should be really big and it needs lots of funding and we need lots of stuff like that. And you look at how those big companies that changed the world economy worked and started. And they always started in these really teeny little things that everybody, you know, like literally Airbnb is called Airbnb because people had air mattresses on their floor in their living room. Like that reflects it. And you know how they funded it? They like printed new labels to cereal boxes and sold these things called Obama O's that then advertised that you could get the air, like, the air bed. Like, they started really small and they proved lots of engagement in that thing. And so when we wanted to build new platform co-ops that are connected to uh, real communities and their bases, we have to figure out how to draw that back to that teeny start and make it viable in the smallest amount. Thanks, that's a really good uh, closing thought to start small so we can all actually apply that to our own projects. So I think um, you're here for the next uh, two days, right? Yep. Till Friday, so I'm sure you might have an opportunity to discuss in a fishbowl or some other session. Absolutely. Um, thanks so much for being here and yep. uh, have a good uh, next session. Thanks.